Welcome to this episode of our program Arab Affairs. Today we'll be discussing an Arab Affairs, rather an important Arab affair, which is the relations between the United Nations and the Arab world or the Arab League or the Arab countries at large. Before uh, we start with our discussion or before elaborating with that, let me first take uh, the headline and because just a few minutes ago uh, there was a press conference that was held between the Kenyan president Oharu Kenyatta and President Fatah Sisi. President Al-Fatah Sisi is already in uh, a one-day visit to Kenya to uh, discuss uh, boosting bilateral uh, relations on all uh, aspects. Uh, just a press uh, conference was held a uh, few uh, minutes ago. As we see, we at the very beginning, we have seen the reception of uh, the president, a very, uh, a very uh, um, important and uh, and very nice reception to President Sisi uh, from the Kenyan uh, president and authorities. Uh, uh, a good gesture, of course, of the strategic relations between both sides at the press conference that was held between both uh, sides. Um, the uh, Kenyan president uh, said that they were keen uh, to cooperate, particularly in the field of trade and uh, investment, and that they are expecting to sign an investment deal uh, at this particular uh, visit. He said that uh, Egypt, under the leadership of Sisi, has asserted its support for uh, Kenya and uh, even uh, expressed appreciation for such a support. He also said that, uh, or vowed, to continue their cooperation to reach uh, peace and security of the continent and the Nile Basin, particularly in areas like South Sudan and Somalia. Uh, he also spoke about the importance of confronting uh, terrorism on his part. President Sisi uh, thanked the president for his hospitality in his reception. Uh, he said that the talks tackled boosting bilateral uh, relations on every uh, or or in many aspects, including the trade and uh, economic relations. He said that Egypt and Kenya are linked through uh, many of their countries' aspirations and that uh, they uh, are going to uh, accelerate with uh, trade exchange, bilateral trade exchange, and increase it, particularly in uh, the upcoming stage. He said that Egypt um, is supporting and will continue to support the strategic relations with Kenya and that it is and has always been keen on consultation with Kenya to achieve the stability and security of the whole African uh, continent at large and the Nile Basin uh, countries uh, in particular. He also said that the two countries are facing common uh, challenges. Atop of them are the uh, terrorism and that they are uh, and will continue uh, their um, consultation on how to uh, achieve the peace and security of the Nile Basin countries and the African uh, continent. This is just a wrap up to uh, this uh, press conference that was just uh, held. The president is in one day visit to Kenya in order to boost relations, to boost already strong relations between the two brothers. Uh, I guess uh, um, the um, talks will be uh, tackling the bilateral relations on all spheres, political, economic and uh, strategic ones. Uh, they will be also consulting on uh, uh, threats or common threats between both countries. At top of them is uh, terrorism and of course the peace and security of the Nile Basin. That is a wrap up to uh, this. We'll be of course updating you in the uh, panoramas and news. Uh, today we'll be speaking about an important uh, file, which is the Arab-UN relations. And that comes in light of the recent visit by the uh, new Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, who uh, was in a Middle East tour, and uh, that tour ended here in um, Egypt. If we speak about the history of the United Nations, then we have to say that the United Nations started from the U.S. Department in 1939, in which U.S. President Franklin uh, Roosevelt suggested uh, 
the name of the United Nations to refer to allies of the World War or the Second World War. In uh, 1942, the declaration of the United Nations was announced by the US and the UK, North Ireland, um, the United uh, Union of the Soviet Republics, the uh, uh, or uh, rather China, Belgium, Canada, Costa Rica, Cuba, Czechoslovakia, Do uh, Dominican Republic, uh, El Salvador, Greece, Guatemala, Haiti, Honduras, India, Luxembourg, New Zealand, Nicaragua, Norway, Panama, Poland, South Africa and Yugoslavia. These were the countries that started the, uh, this uh, convention. They were 24 countries in particular. On the 25th of April 1945, the United Nations uh, uh, started their conference on international organization and they started in San Francisco along with some non-governmental organizations including of course the Rotary and the Lions. They drafted the charter by 26th of June. 50 countries signed and were joined uh, later by Poland and later on the same year they were joined by Arab countries including Egypt, Lebanon, Saudi Arabia, Syria, Iraq and uh, then they all uh, uh, joined the United Nations that was by the end of 1945, starting from October till December. The UN has worked on the peace or as peacekeepers for uh, the Middle East or as peace monitor, uh, monitors to the Middle East uh, conflict and to the Palestinian cause in particular. Uh, the first meeting of the General Assembly officially started in uh, on the 10th of January 1946. The Secretary General, uh, uh, the Security, rather the, uh, the, the Security Council, uh, Council uh, assumed it's uh, or convened one week later. The idea started, uh, of course, with the uh, social uh, arena to foster human rights economic development, decolonization, health and education. Not before 1991 that the hopes for the body to prevent uh, conflicts and work as uh, a world, uh, or, or rather to work for world peace, that uh, became a must, of course, that was after the break of the USSR or the uh, Russian, uh, uh, the uh, Union of the Russian Republics, and because of the um, many conflicts that erupted throughout uh, the world, that suggested that this uh, world body needs to extend its uh, uh, its mission. Um, of course, the break of the USSR has left the United States uh, in global dominance, creating a variety of problems to the United Nations. The UN system is based on uh, six principal organs, the General Assembly, the Security Council, the Economic Council, the Social Council, the Secretary, the International Court of Justice, the ICJ, of course, other sub organs uh, including of course the UNICEF, the uh, uh, UNESCO, the UNDP uh, uh, and other of course organs are working on other missions of course including health, science, uh, education, youth and many uh, others. This is the United Nations. Uh, worth to say that uh, 10 secretary uh, generals have assumed uh, posts starting 1946 until uh, and up till this uh, minute. Um, one of them was the great Botros, uh, Botros Ghali. He assumed office in 1992 and uh, the United States of America vetoed his second term, saying that he was not, or claiming he was not able to uh, make the uh, reforms or the expected reforms. Yes, and uh, yes, and I guess that if we uh, move on to uh, the Arab League, but I guess before moving, uh, 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 yes, we'll move to the Arab League and as the United Nations uh, 
uh, or history we spoke about. We'll also speak about the uh, history of the Arab League, which has started its mission even before the United Nations, and that was in uh, 19, uh, for, or rather in March 1945. The Arab League. The Arab League is a regional uh, organization of Arab countries and uh, it tackles the affairs of the North, uh, Northern Africa or the Horn of Africa and Arabia. And yes, and uh, it, uh, it formed uh, in Cairo on the 22nd of March, as I said, in 1945. Before I continue on with uh, uh, my, uh, uh, in, um, with, with the information I'm giving about the Arab League, we have with us over the phone uh, uh, Ambassador Ahmed Haggag, our former uh, ambassador to Kenya. Good evening to you, sir. Hello? 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 Yes, good evening to you, uh, Ambassador Hagag. Hello? <clears throat> yes, I guess there is a technical problem and I guess uh, they will sort it out. Um... Hello? Okay, so uh, the Arab League started with uh, six uh, members, Egypt, Iraq, Jordan, Lebanon, Saudi Arabia and Syria. Then Yemen joined in May 1945. Currently the League includes 22 uh, 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 countries, but Syria's of course membership was uh, suspended due to the uh, turmoil. Uh, we return back to Ambassador Hagag. Ambassador Hagag. Hello? Hello? Yes. Good afternoon to you, Ambassador Hagag. I cannot hear you. Can you hear me? Uh, uh, if Hello? I just uh, raise my voice, Ambassador Hagag? I cannot hear you. Right. Thank you very much, Ambassador Hagag. Right. Uh, being on the League main... Yes. The League main goal is to draw closer relations between member states and coordinate collaboration between them to safeguard their independence and sovereignty and to co uh, consider in general the welfare of the Arab countries. Today we'll be speaking about the United Nations and the Arab countries relations uh, at large. How did it get throughout the years? How? is the United Nations continuing on with its uh, mission to uh, safeguard or to be a real representative to uh, the whole world, not rather the uh, five powers. Before we start, let's watch the uh, Arab news that took place during this week and we'll come back for discussion. Chaired by the Armed Forces Chief of Staff General Mahmoud Hegezi, the National Committee concerned with Libya held a meeting today with a delegation of the Higher Libyan Council of State. The meeting reviewed the outcome of recent meetings hosted by Cairo on stepped-up efforts to end a political deadlock on the Libyan crisis. The Libyan delegation expressed readiness for forming a delegation of the Higher Council to launch a dialogue with the Libyan House of Representatives regarding the issues disputed in the amended political agreement on means of ending the Libyan conflict. Syrian government officials sat face to face with rebels for the second time in three weeks in Kazakhstan as diplomats stepped up efforts to lay the groundwork for peace talks next week. Head of the Russian delegation to the talks in Astana said that an agreement has been reached to form a permanent contact group of the three nations to preserve the ceasefire. The meeting sponsored by Russia, Turkey and Iran is intended to pave the way for the revival of UN-led peace talks in Geneva next week. Meanwhile, the Syrian government envoy to the talks accused Turkey of continuing to support terrorist groups and urged Ankara to withdraw its troops from Syria. 
UN officials and diplomats said on Thursday that a new body is being set up at the United Nations in Geneva to prepare prosecutions of war crimes committed in Syria. The General Assembly voted to establish the mechanism in December and UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres is due to name a judge or prosecutor as it had this month. A UN human rights official said that the team will analyze information, organize and prepare files on the worst abuses that amount to international crimes, primarily war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide, and identify those responsible. While it would not be able to prosecute itself, the idea is to prepare files for future prosecution that states or the International Criminal Court in The Hague could use. The focus on prosecutions means evidence collected since 2011 by a UN Commission of Inquiry may be sharpened into legal action. Right, welcome back, and uh, let me welcome our guest, Dr. Ibrahim Ghazawi, political analyst. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you so much. Uh, if I may start with the just uh, the few minutes uh, press conference that was held between President Sisi and uh, the Kenyan uh, president. President Sisi is in Kenya for one day visit to uh, discuss, of course, common threats and bilateral relations. Uh, the timing of this visit. Um, the timing is so important and so sensitive, but let me start with the, uh, shedding the light on the, the need for such uh, relations with not only Kenya, but all the Nile Basin countries and all African countries indeed. We have this chronic and long-standing interest to have very cordial and uh, uh, warm relations with all African uh, community countries. Uh, when we talk about Kenya, uh, yes, Kenya, one of the uh, countries of the Nile Basin countries that has been always in, uh, in its uh, uh, politics when it comes to uh, 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 regional cooperation and water resources uh, concerns uh, supportive to Egypt. Um, historically, we have very good relations with Kenya. But today, I, I think that even it's even more uh, uh, favorable for us today. Uh, President uh, Oharo Kenyatta is known to be uh, um, um, welcoming such good relations with Egypt. Mm. And, and let me tell you that Kenyans, as, as many other Africans in most of the African countries, are, are respecting are, and are in, in good um, hope to have good relations with Egyptians. Egypt has good, um, good position in the hearts of Africans. Uh, I have been to Kenya several times before and I know that and probably we have been away from Africa for some time. Today uh, this visit uh, came at the, the, the due time and date and probably it's, it is late. But uh, the, the, the press conference that have been done today and have in my way to the, uh, the TV uh, building, I was uh, uh, hearing the, uh, live on the radio the press conference, yes. and I was impressed. I was impressed by the, the sincere words of the Kenyan president. Yeah. And I know for sure that he is fully uh, serious and he's fully loyal, and uh, he meant every single word he said. Yes. Uh, he welcomed uh, President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi uh, open heartedly there, and, and he said that he, and you, 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 Mr. President, uh, we welcome you, and, and we feel you, you feel that like you are at home, and you are more than welcome. And he reiterated it even the word several times. Yes, we have uh, seen the, yeah. even the hospitality and the warm reception the president got exactly, there. Exactly, exactly. But I also would like to recall one of the recent um, uh, positive signals of the relation between Kenya and Egypt um, that happened in, in November uh, 2016, a few months ago. A visit paid by the Vice President at that time, uh, William uh, uh, Otto, uh, and he met also President uh, Abdel Fattah al-Sisi in, in Cairo, and uh, of course it was so positive I and mean, a lot of signals have been launched at that time opening the way 
for more tight and, and, and warmer relations with Kenya. But one of them that drew my attention was uh, a really a uh, statement that we have to stick to. Uh, he said at that time that Kenya has exempted Egyptians, Egyptian nationals, from obtaining prior visa to get into Kenya. Mm. That means simply that uh, Egyptians can go and get the visa at the airport, which is really so impressive and very warm signal that, yes, the gate is open for Egypt to, to, uh, to be part of the Kenyan uh, daily life, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, steps. So we have to build on that. Uh, also, the pr President uh, Kenyatta, uh, during his statement, uh, he, he, um, he stressed that we have a lot in common between Egypt and, and Kenya. Common threats, of particularly, course, yes. Yeah, and common hopes and common, common aspirations. Hopes, common threats. Yes. Common challenges and, and common future. Mm. And that's what he said. And, 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 and this and, is reality. And, and even stressed very much by President Sisi. Exactly, yes. exactly. That, that, this is um, a, you know, a self-explanatory uh, statement that we can build on that. A lot of, a lot of uh, um, um, uh, more serious and, and well-elaborated steps towards more uh, tight, tighter relations with Kenya not only Kenya, it has to be the whole region indeed. But Kenya is, is just a, a very positive uh, take-off point to today. What we heard today from the press conference is a clear-cut signal that gates are all open for such relations to take much more and deeper uh, depths of, of uh, consolidated steps. Yes. And we have to build on that. We really, we both, in both countries, we, we need this. Right, indeed, very much indeed, and Egypt has been keen on its uh, uh, African rule since it's returned uh, back to the heart of Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess that is the main message that Egypt is very much keen on the uh, African uh, continent at large and, of course, the uh, stability and security of the Nile Basin uh, in particular. If we move on to uh, our topic of the day and the United Nations, and we've just seen the visit of uh, the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres uh, to uh, Egypt, part of his Middle East tour, uh, where he ended here in Egypt to take the final and clear uh, vision of how to deal with Middle East aspects. First, the UN relations with the Arab world's and how were it, particularly that the United Nations started its mission as peacekeeping or peace monitoring to the Middle East conflict and the Palestinian cause since the very beginning? Uh, well, U United Nations was established in, in 1945, in the wake of uh, World War II. Of course, one of the main hopes at that time, the main targets of the UN at that time, was to put an end to atrocities caused by uh, this uh, bloody wars. Um, of, at that time, of course, the, the, the formation and the details of, of the organization, the charter itself, the way it was phrased, and the way the, way the, the main organ of the UN uh, bodies, which is Security Council, was formed, was a real reflection at that time of the way of these countries at this very early stage of the UN history. I'm talking specifically about uh, the uh, uh, distinctive um, uh, uh, position of United States, of uh, China, United Kingdom, uh, 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 France, and uh, uh, Soviet Union at that time, we were the permanent members of the Security Council. Uh, the permanent members of Security Council at that time, of course, had, have, had assumed very unique and uh, uh, a more favorable uh, uh, position when, when it came at that time and still so far to deciding on uh, objective matters that concern international peace and security. Uh, today, probably after this long years of the existence on the ground, we have witnessed a sort of qualitative and quantitative shifting in terms of uh, the powers and in international relations stage. 
we have seen the United States coming to the forefront. And rather to the dominance. Yeah, the rather to the dominance, uh, indeed. And we have seen Soviet Union dismantling and uh, 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 substituted by uh, <coughs> Russia later. And we have seen, of course, recession of the role of United Kingdom, recession of the role of, uh, of France, and the international uh, you know, relations stage. Uh, and of course, China is probably the only uh, power that is still uh, holding up and even you know, uh, getting larger and, and deeper. Um, but still the issue is um, who have the main points in, in, um, in uh, directing the, the waves of decision-making uh, process in the United Nations. And when we talk about the United Nations, although we have five organs, on top of them Security Council and uh, General Assembly, but uh, practically, who have the upper uh, word and upper hand in, in the, the process of handling international concerns and peace and, and, uh, and security, we'll talk about the Security Council. Security Council is 15 member state. Out of the 15, there are five permanent uh, countries. Who have the right of a veto. Yes, they have the right of the veto in, in whatever objective uh, decision is to be made, and uh, the, such decisions, the decisions usually address the main concerns and very sensitive issues uh, that concern uh, peace and stability uh, in the world. It has to be taken with five members of the Security Council agreeing on that. Should one of these countries, for any reason or another, see itself not in favor of such decision, they can easily stop it. They can block the whole process. And that has been carried, and that out, have throughout been carried out throughout things. the history of United Nations. And uh, th th this is actually a situation that is not going to change, uh, you know, unfortunately. Mm. Uh, it's not going to change recently or in the near future because even uh, Secretary General uh, uh, Antonio uh, uh, Guterres. Guterres, he has said it in, in a very diplomatic manner. He said in, in, in one of his stops before coming to Cairo, probably in the in, uh, United Arab Emirates, he said one very expressive statement when he said the United Nations is what its members want it to be. Yes. Uh, so th this is really... Uh, but he also said at the Abu Dhabi conference that Yes, the United Nations is what its members want to be, but that he wants to reform it to be what it should be doing. Well, naturally, I'm optimistic, but let me tell you, he can't do this. I mean, we have to be honest and we have to be realistic. Um, and, well, the, the, well, he could have some right to say this, or probably some hopes, yes. Or we have to recall uh, Dr. Boutros Ghali. Uh, uh, situations. And, and, uh, when he, when, when when he, he was, was yes, of up course, to when, prevent when he something. released, when he refused the, the, the American pressure on him at that time to release the Kana uh, massacre on, on Lebanon. And he was uh, so much uh, uh, determined to, to, to give to the public this report to let the world see exactly what the, the Israeli uh, uh, barbarian forces have done there, and the, the cost, the, the price was his second uh, term. term. And even at that time, the, the uh, Secretary of State, uh, uh, Madeleine Albright, said mm. and told him, you will not stay at that office again another term. And uh, she even danced a tango on, 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 uh, on the corridor there, and because she fulfilled her promise and, and he was not given another uh, term. This is an embodiment on the ground of the, the realities of, mm. of power politics in your end. Will that be changing uh, uh, soon? I don't think so, but I, I'm, I'm hoping with, mm. with Secretary General, and of course all of us have the same hope that, that he can manage to do this. Does he have uh, real chances to do that? The answer for this question is not at his hand, unfortunately. The answer is at Washington DC, at the White House. Will America accept to relinquish some of its power 
over United Nations and over Security Council? This is the real question. Let me take that. But before I continue on with uh, our discussion, let's first have this quick uh, report and uh, the Palestinian cause, uh, the United Nations, and how was it tackled during his uh, visit or during the secretary, the new Secretary General visit uh, here to the Middle East? Let's watch the report. The Arab League chief Ahmad Abul Ghid said resolving the Israeli-Palestinian conflict would require a two-state solution a day after Washington signaled it would drop that demand. Abul Ghid affirmed that the conflict requires a comprehensive and just peace based on a two-state resolution with an independent Palestinian state. Abul Ghid announcement was made in a statement after he met UN Chief Antonio Guterres in Cairo. Guterres has also called for a two-state solution on Wednesday in a speech in Cairo, saying there was no plan B. The Arab League statement said he and Abul Ghid agreed that the two-state solution remains the main way to achieving peace. The statement put them at odds with Trump, who said at the White House meeting with Netanyahu that Mideast peace doesn't necessarily had to include the establishment of a Palestinian state. Trump said he could accept a two-state solution or a single-state ag arrangement if it is agreed upon by all sides. Netanyahu also was cool to the idea of an independent Palestine, saying he didn't want to deal with labels. U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations Nikki Haley said the United States still supports a two-state solution to a Palestinian-Israeli conflict. Haley also echoed Trump in his remarks, stressing that the peace deal was not for Washington to impose. Right, welcome back and back to you, Dr. Ibrahim, the uh, United Nations and the Arab world, the United Nations and the Arab causes. Um, and I guess that the United Nations has been very much involved in every Arab uh, aspect, even more than being involved in many other conflicts around the world. Mm -hmm. uh, how can we really um, describe the UN efforts in the Middle East or uh, its engagement in the, uh, uh, the Middle East uh, conflicts or causes or whatever we can call them? Um, well, th that's a good question, and we have to to be um, um, objective and also uh, honest while trying to, you know, analyze the UN role in the Middle East. W we have to divide this role into two branches. One branch goes to the political issues, and one branch goes to non-political issues, which is humanitarian, educational, health care, agriculture, uh, financial, whatever, okay? So this, this non-political course of your in involvement, not only in the Middle East, but in the whole world indeed, they have gone long way in, in success indeed. Uh, uh, UN through its main organs like UNDP, like uh, uh, UNESCO, uh, like UNICEF, uh, uh, all these organizations and, uh, um, um, have been so active positively in helping a lot of societies. The UNRWA. The UNRWA, of course. For the refugees. The UNHCR. Or, the uh, UNHCR, uh, UNHCR, yes. UNHCR. Um, they are so involved in many positive humanitarian, uh, educational, health, uh, uh, cultural, in, in a lot of humanitarian uh, and, and societal issues. As I said, not only in Middle East region, but in the whole world. Probably we know more about Middle East, and probably Middle East absorb much more of the attention of the international news because we have been always in sizzling pot here. I have a lot of problems and a lot of clashes, conflicts never stop in the Middle East area. That's why Middle East t take the, 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 the biggest share of, of news and coverage and problems in the world, which is so bad. I mean, this is nothing to be uh, bragging about or, or proud of, but this is reality. The, this is one line, the, the humanitarian line. 
And in this line, yes, we have to, to uh, hail and um, encourage the UN role in the region. They have been playing so productive role and they have been uh, so instrumental in uh, uh, collecting and gathering international support to humanitarian causes in the region, whether through accepting refugees or, uh, or providing uh, food, ed education ser educational services, uh, uh, health care, uh, UNHCR, of course, which is mainly concerned with refugees mm. in, in the region and UNRWA, UNRWA. In, in particular mm. in, in Palestinian occupied lands. So in, in this trajectory, yes, the UN have gone so far, uh, so successful indeed, and we have to encourage this role. The other role, which is political, they have gone nil to zero point mm. in, in, uh, in trying to resolve any problem in the region indeed. Um, let me tell you, uh, this, you is, this here, is not because... In particular, preventing uh, conflicts in, and in, preserving peace. Well, neither of those, you know. It, wasn't, it was neither successful in preventing nor in handling or resolving. Nor in, nor in reaching peace. Yes. And, uh, well, to be honest also, this is not the problem of the UN itself because the, the UN is not autonomous organization. It's, it's not, they are not acting up on their own in the UN. And because I have been working with UN peace uh, operations several times before, and I know how the structure of yeah. uh, peacekeeping processes or conflict resolution process take place on the ground there in United Nations venues. So I know by heart that this is not the sole resolution of the United Nations. There are other uh, uh, dominant powers yeah. who can, of course, uh, um, um, direct the, the, you know, the solutions and, and handling process into another ways. So we have this always sort of conflicting interests and in international powers, especially when it comes to the Middle East. In such a situation of this conflicting interests and powers, especially we talk about United States and you talk about Israel. So when it comes to this very particular issue of Palestinian cause, which is the main concern for the whole Arab world for years and years, and some of the analysts and, and the scholars mm. even have described this cause as the main cause for terrorism in the whole world. Yes. And it's still so far unresolved. I guess we will have to stop at this point. And I guess this discussion has to be continued uh, next week. Inshallah. Dr. Brahim Ghazawi, thank you very much for joining us. I guess you will be joining us next week, right? Inshallah. To continue our conversation. Inshallah. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, dear viewers, uh, before we uh, just wrap up our episode, let's watch a quick report on the economic, on the Arab economic news that took place during this week. Many thanks for watching. President Fatah Sisi inaugurated on Tuesday the first International Petroleum Conference and exhibition held at the Cairo International Conference Center. The three-day gathering includes three conferences to be addressed by 100 speakers from 80 countries. Attending the event, Prime Minister Sharif Ismail said the oil sector aims to reach the highest investment levels during the coming years to cope with the ambitious programs in the oil industry and gas fields, stressing that transparency, political stability and promising oil potentials are the most important factors that contributed to attracting oil investments to Egypt throughout the past three years. For his part, Minister of Petroleum and Mineral Resources Tariq Al-Mullah said Egypt is taking serious and swift steps to improve the investment atmosphere of the oil and gas sectors to guarantee the flow of foreign finances, especially in the fields of research and exploration, which would have a direct impact on the sustainability of the country's energy supplies and address its needs. Meanwhile, Sharif Ismail witnessed a signing deal between Minister of Oil, Tariq Al-Mullah, and CEO of INI, Claudio Disclazzi, and CEO of BP, Bob Dudley. According to the deal, BP will earn 10% of INI's bonds in the Zohr 
gas field development projects. The New Deal reflects Egypt's success in attracting new partners for its investment projects. Zohr Gas Field is one of the biggest gas fields in the Mediterranean region. Oman's oil minister Mohammed Al Rumahi told reporters at an oil conference in Kuwait City on Wednesday that the non OPEC oil producers are expected to cut output further this month under a landmark deal with the cartel aimed at curbing a global supply glut. OPEC and non OPEC countries, including Russia, agreed in November to reduce output by about 1.8 million barrels per day following a sharp drop in oil prices. Man is one of 11 non OPEC oil producers which agreed to slash the total crude production by about 558,000 barrels per day. Rumahi said non OPEC producers have delivered on more than half of their pledged cuts and he expected them to reduce output further in the coming weeks. His comments came after Kuwait, head of a committee tasked with overseeing implementation of the deal, said OPEC had made more than 90% of the cuts it agreed.